Oh, gracious Heavenly Father, we need you once again. We need your Holy Spirit to open our eyes, to open our hearts to just this word, this passage, which we're all too but familiar with. And it's a tough passage to go through, to read and to see your command for discipleship to us. And so we just pray now. Again, help us to take this in tenderly. Help me, to, Lord, to be a vessel as I serve your people. And I just pray, Lord, that this text really preaches to our hearts this morning as we live and as we go about the Christian life and as we follow you. Lord, we give you all the glory and all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. You know, most of us, if not all, we love receiving invitations, especially unexpected ones. Whether you know, you're invited to a wedding or a birthday party, it's always a joy when we get to open an invitation. Uh, of course, nowadays, we receive evites or, or email invitations, which is sort of almost the same thing. You know, I remember um, my wedding invitation or our wedding invitations, my wife and I. My wife uh, worked really hard uh, with her friends uh, in making sure that the invitation was right. right? She, she had all the printing done, and uh, she had all the wax seals. I mean, it was a big, big deal for our wedding day. She spent countless hours trying to prepare our, our wedding invitations. But before the wedding invitations, I remember we had what we call a, a save the date. And we use that today as well. Um, it's a moment where, where we announce to our closest friends and family that we would be united as one under God, right? That, that was the save the date announcement. So first, we had the save the date announcement. That's what was going to happen in the future. And then we had the invitation that followed a couple months after, right, to come and join us as, and witness, really, this special occasion, right? The invitation was all about where, where two people would come together no longer being identified as two individuals, but as one. And the reason why I tell you this, because this morning, we find Jesus essentially doing the same thing. He's making his announcement. He's making his, his passion announcement. And then he, he invites his disciples to come and follow him, which I'll flesh out in the end. So keep that in mind as we go through this text. Jesus makes this gospel announcement, this is save the date, and then he, he, makes, he comes with this invitation right after to come and follow him, to be united with him by being a disciple of Christ. And again, it's really a call to discipleship, to leave our identities behind and be united as Christ as one and to follow him. That's discipleship. Therefore, my, my aim this morning is this. Jesus calls his followers to consider the cost of discipleship and follow him. Jesus calls his followers to consider the cost of discipleship and follow him. You know, much has been said about this passage, especially in the past 15 years. Um, there have been great books written about this passage, like Radical or Crazy Love, uh, conferences have been themed around this passage. I mean, great preachers have countless sermons on this text. And so when, when Rod gave me this text, I was like, I don't know what to say. That's, there's nothing new under the sun. And he just started laughing. He said, you could do it. <laughs> and so, again, many of us have maybe read or heard about this passage so many times. But let me be honest with you, it's going to be different. Um, I mean, 10 years ago, I probably would have preached this differently than today. 10 years ago, I was, I was single. I had no family. But today, um, I do have a family, and so I'm going to preach it a little bit differently. And 10 years from now, it might be a little bit more different. I mean, I, I don't know where I'll be, but I want you to know this. The message of the gospel and the invitation from Jesus to follow him will always be the same for us regardless of where we're at in life, until he takes us to his heavenly home. So as we go through this text, I want us to think through the implications for ourselves, 
for our own walk with God, for our families, for our community, and really for our church. It's a challenge to consider our own walks with Jesus. And so the question I have for you is, are you living in total abandonment to him? Are you living in total abandonment to him? The calling is serious, and the consequences are eternal. Think through that today. The calling is serious, and some of us may even be offended. I was offended studying this text. I was greatly offended. But I thought about, I thought about Christ, and I remembered how offended he was by all the people all the people he's preaching to, all the people he was healing, all the people that he was ministering to up until this point. Again, think through this today. Before we jump into, straight into our text, I think it's important that we back up a little bit um, to provide some context to Jesus' invitation. And that's why I read um, verses 27 to 30. Uh, because it's always helpful for us to understand the context together. So what, what I wanted to do is start this morning really with the disciples. It's easy to give the disciples a hard time because they really don't know how the story ends at this point in Mark's gospel. And so I want us to see um, really the disciple, th their side, so to speak. It's what I call the disciples' perspective, the disciples' perspective, which takes us to our first point. Verse 27, and Jesus went on with the disciples to the villages of Caesarea, Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do you say that I am? And they told them, John the Baptist, you know, they say Elijah, and others, one of the prophets. And he asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered, you are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one. What we find here is that the disciples see Jesus, but they don't see everything. It's the same image as a blind man in the, in the prior scene, where at first, remember, he saw like tre as trees walking and so as Pastor Rod mentioned last month uh, about talking about Peter's fuzzy faith, Peter knew the answer. The disciples knew the answer, but he didn't know. They didn't know what the answer meant. They didn't know what the answer meant. The disciples knew or had this view of Jesus, but they didn't know what all of it meant at this point. Okay? So follow me. If, if, if we pull back even more, we recall the first eight chapters of Mark and it points to who Jesus is, okay? That's the whole point of the first eight chapters of Mark is, is who Jesus is. And we're definitely gonna see Jesus' point of view later. But I don't think many of us have ever considered the disciples' point of view. I mean, it's, it's again, like I mentioned, it's easy to criticize the disciples, especially Peter, right? Shoot from the hip, Peter. Say anything, Peter. But I think what I fail to realize as I study this text really is, is putting myself in the disciples' shoes. First, let me allow, let, allow me to show you who Jesus is really from a, a historical perspective, according to the disciples, from a historical perspective. The text I just read the passage, Who do you say I am? They told them John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others one of the prophets. The disciples and others were working off a framework, the framework they only knew up until this point about Jesus. And their, frame, their framework of Jesus, the Messiah, really was based off the Old Testament. So follow me. Here, here's what I mean. Ever since they were children, the disciples were told the, 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 this very story of the coming Messiah King who will rescue them from evil and injustice, and he would go to the throne. Just imagine that. Just imagine as children at your bedside or on their mother's knee that they were told of this king, this son of man, this Messiah coming to save their people. You know, we read bedtime stories to our daughter, and I know a lot of people here have different convictions about Disney. I am still working through mine, so... Um, <laughs> Her favorite story is Frozen. And so if you could imagine, you know, she knows Frozen like the back of her hand, the story of Frozen where Queen Elsa survives at the end and everything is all right. But if you can imagine 25 years later, 
I tell her the same story, and I say, well, you know what? The queen dies. What do you think her reaction would be? No way, Daddy. That's not how, that's not how the story goes. And so you can imagine the same scene here where the disciples, they hear this story. They, they work off their framework. And l- listen, I'm going to go through some passages in the Old Testament, some passages that are familiar to the disciples, passages from the prophets like Isaiah. Isaiah, we, we've read Isaiah 53 so many times the past month. But Isaiah really is a servant songs, or, or it talks about the suffering servant in Isaiah 53. But walk with me as, as I read these passages. Isaiah 59, 20. And a redeemer will come to Zion, to those in Jacob who turn from transgression. Or passages like Micah, Micah 4, 1 and 2. Again, remember, these are, these are passages the disciples know. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains. And it shall be lifted up above the hills, and peoples shall flow to it. And many nations shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that he may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Or passages like Zechariah 14.9. And the Lord will be king over all the earth, and on that day the Lord will be one, and his name one. Or a passage we're all too, too familiar with in Daniel, the prediction of Jesus. Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 to 14. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like the Son of Man, and he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him, and to him who was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages uh, should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. The disciples grew up studying texts just like these, yet never fully grasped who Jesus is. I like R.C. Sproul's commentary, and he writes how even the rabbis of Israel understood the concept of, of the Messiah, but never entirely connected the dots for, to the suffering Messiah. He writes, quote, In other words, the picture of the Messiah in the Old Testament is not monochromatic, but a vast complexity of ideas come together in this promised figure. He would be a king. He would be a shepherd. He would be a redeemer. However, there was one element that the rabbis seemed to overlook. The Messiah would suffer. End quote. Just like the disciples, they had an accurate view of the Messiah, but it was all but incomplete. Historically, the disciples were going by what they knew about by virtue of the Old Testament. You are the Christ. You may be Elijah, you may be a prophet. You are the Christ. Not only did they have a historical view, but they also had a present view of Jesus, a present view of Jesus. Who is Jesus presently according to the disciples? If you recall their journey from ordinary men to disciples, Listen here, remember this, they left everything for him. They left everything to follow Jesus. Think about this. This man they've heard about growing up is finally here. They considered the cost the moment Jesus came calling back in Mark chapter 3 or Mark chapter 1, and they left their families, they left their jobs, they left the comforts of life to follow the Messiah who was going to save them. If you remember, Pastor Rod preached on Mark 1, where Peter had what? He, they talked about Peter's mother-in-law. And so Peter left his family to follow Jesus Christ. They left everything, from what we could tell in the first eight chapters. And so not only did they leave their families and jobs behind, they experienced ministry firsthand. Okay, this is the present view. They experienced ministry firsthand. The first eight chapters show us who Jesus is, and the disciples had a front row seat as they followed him from one city to the next. Let's briefly go over who Jesus is and what the disciples witness. The first thing they witness is the reason for his coming. They they witness his coming announcement. 
Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God. Mark chapter 1, verse 14. They witnessed the great missionary to the nations. Remember, Jesus, he was always going from, from east to west on the Sea of Galilee and from north to south. Right? He was preaching to the Jews, to the Gentiles. He preached in almost all regions surrounding the Sea of Galilee. He sent out his disciples in chapter 6. He ministered. He ministered and he preached to the multitudes for hours throughout the day. Right? He preached in parables. He preached to the crowds. He even preached in his hometown in chapter 6. Remember, he went back to his hometown and he started teaching and then they rejected him. He also demonstrated his power. He demonstrated his power over creation, over demonic opposition, over the sick, over the blind, over the crippled. He raised the dead. He fed the multitudes. Jesus, the greatest pastor, missionary, leader, teacher, and servant. According to the disciples, based on a historical and present view of Jesus, he was going to make everything right. I mean, do you understand this? If you, were to, if you had this framework and you were ministering with Jesus, you'd be all in. Yeah, I am all in. I'm all in for you, Jesus. You're going to save us. You're going to redeem us. You're going to bring peace. Yes, let's do it. All the evidence Mark presents in the first eight chapters point to him as Messiah. And that's why Peter said, you are the Christ. You are the Messiah. But what happens next is really the turning point in the book of Mark. The Old Testament stories that the disciples knew all their lives, it took a sudden twist. It took a sudden twist. Remember what I said. The disciples were only working off their framework for what they knew about Jesus in the Old Testament. Jesus accepts what Peter says. He says, you're right, I am the Christ. But Jesus also says, look, there's something else that, might ha that, that must happen. It's like Jesus saying, I am the king, but I'm not like the king you were expecting. In other words, Jesus is saying, you're right, Peter, I am the Christ, but hold on just a minute. Something must happen before I save you. Which brings us to our next point. It's what I call the sufferer's prediction. The sufferer's prediction, and I know the heading gives it away. The first thing I want us to notice here is Jesus' most surprising statement up until this point. It's what I call the great truth. The great truth. And so here's the gospel announcement. Here's the save the date. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And as mentioned last week, this was the first of three passion statements or predictions that shows up in Mark's gospel, meaning there is no occurrence in the previous eight chapters of Mark's gospel where Jesus mentioned himself suffering or dying up until this point. That was this clear. Now, there were little details, little hints that Jesus would give. In John, he hinted that he would destroy the temple and in three days he will rise it up. If you remember his interaction with Nicodemus in John 3, he says this, and, and as Moses lifted up the serpent, serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. In Matthew, Jesus refers to how the bridegroom will be taken away, and that's in reference to his sufferings. But clearly, this is something new. Something new coming out of Jesus. This announcement is something new coming out of Jesus' mouth. He must suffer, be rejected, and be killed. Therefore, Jesus' statement here turned the disciples' world upside down. They were stunned. Never before this moment has anyone connected the Son of Man to the suffering Messiah. And in this text, Jesus begins to lay out what he must do in order for him to be the complete Messiah of the Old Testament. I like how one writer puts it. In other words, he says this, Jesus is saying, I'm not going to Jerusalem to live, but to die. I'm not going to Jerusalem to gain power, but to lose power. 
I'm not going to Jerusalem to rule over everyone, but to serve. I'm not going to, Jer- to, to Jerusalem to defeat the authorities here on earth, but I'm going to defeat evil. That's what Jesus is saying. And I want you to sense the tension build. In other translations, it says that he must suffer and that he must be killed. Jesus is not saying that he's come to die, but he has to die. It's absolutely necessary that Jesus dies in order for the redemptive story to take its proper place in history. And just so there's no confusion, what does Mark add? Look at verse 32. Jesus says what? He said this, or Mark adds, he said this plainly, without a doubt, plain as day. Mark makes a point to stress this out. There's there's no symbolism here. There's no allegory from Jesus. Jesus wanted to be clear on what he was going to do. He was literally going to die. He concealed nothing. He laid it all out, even pointing to the specific groups that would be there to kill him in the end, right? Who are the groups there? The elders, the chief priests, the scribes. In fact, they were there at the beginning of his death, and they will be there at the cross. Not only that, but Jesus also mentioned, mentions his own resurrection. This is so much to take in for the disciples. Wait, wait, you're going to die, and then you're going you're to write? You're going to raise up from the dead? You're going to rise up from the dead? Now, can you imagine the disciples? Again, remember, their whole life, they waited for this Messiah. And you could just sense just this, this, the disciples being absolutely speechless. Except for one man, of course. Look at verse 32. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. The word rebuke is the same word that was connected to Jesus' condemnation of demons when, when Jesus silenced the demons back in Mark chapter 1. One commentary put it this way. It is clear that Peter's protest was not mild by any means. He stood up to Jesus, and he brought the full measure of hostility to his rebuke. Think about this. Peter, just a moment earlier, said to Jesus, you are the Christ. And the next moment, he confronted and admonished his own master. I think Matthew's account helps us understand the nature of Peter's reaction or his rebuke. In Matthew 16, 22, it says, Peter says this, far be it from you, Lord, This shall never happen to you. It was as if Peter saying, that's not how the kingdom story goes. No way. Remember, Peter didn't fully understand the weight of this moment. He was working through his fuzzy faith. He didn't fully see the truth yet. yet. Nevertheless, we find Jesus' response, and I call it the great warning. The great warning. You know, I, I was reading uh, an offshoot commentary on these particular verses, just these two verses alone, and the author noted um, a Dutch theologian whose sermon title of this passage was Satan at the Pulpit of the Passion. Satan at the Pulpit of the Passion. And he was referring to Peter's rebuke. And the author concluded, he said, Satan is present as our Lord mounts his pulpit and begins to teach the disciples concerning his passion. Do we understand Jesus' reaction here? When Peter was rebuking him? Look at verse 33. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. Again, it's the same exact word that was used when Peter rebuked Jesus. Now, I want us to remember, at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, he was tempted by the devil in the wilderness, right? It was, it was, there was an account in Mark chapter 1, but Matthew had a more detailed account. Matthew chapter 4, let me read it for you, verses 8 to 10. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. What was Satan's offering to Jesus? He was saying this. Satan was saying, look, Jesus, there's no cross, no rejection, no suffering. 
ultimately no death. Jesus saying, Satan was saying to Jesus during the time of this wilderness, you want the throne, Jesus? There's a way to get there with no pain or suffering. So what we find here in our passage is Satan's temptation once again by virtue of Peter. Remember Matthew's account of Peter's words. Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. In other words, Peter's saying, you want the throne, Jesus? You can get there with no pain or suffering. Same idea. But Jesus knew the importance of his own prediction. And he continues, verse 33, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Jesus then shows Peter what we all know too well. There's God's way and there's man's way. The world follows Satan and the perishable things he has to offer, but true disciples of Jesus set their minds on the things of God. Are you setting your minds on the things of God, church? Or are you setting your mind on, on the things of this world? Just like the Apostle Paul, he warns us, he tells us, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above. Where Christ, seek the things where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things of this earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Jesus then goes even further in the following verses. He says, Peter, you're not getting it. Let me tell you what it means to be a true disciple, which brings us to our last point, which I call the king's proclamation. The king's proclamation. Here's the invitation, church. Here's the invitation to discipleship. And the first thing we find here is the command to self-denial, the command to self-denial. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. If anyone would be my disciple, Jesus is saying, first, you must deny yourself. It's really a call in putting to death the one thing that's most important to you, which is yourself. That is the one thing that is important to you, yourself. Here's what I mean. The world spends billions of dollars trying to help you find your identity. I mean, we have a show that's starting up again. It's called American Idol. The world wants you to find yourself. The world wants you to build, the world wants to build your self-esteem. Yet Jesus, on the other hand, is calling his followers to kill all that, to not find identity in the world and to find identity with him. Let me go further. It means you or your inner self recognizes your own sinfulness and that we are called to abandon our self-love, our self-exaltation, our self-effort, our self-confidence, our self-consciousness. You're saying no to your ambitions, your agenda, your plans that you identify with, and you're really disowning yourself for the sake of Christ. Now, I know this is really heavy. I read this, and I said, no way. But let me give you an example. I think the Bible is the best illustration. Turn your Bibles with me to Philippians 2. Let me give you an example from the Bible. As Paul was describing the service of one Christian servant, and I went through this with the sync team just a couple weeks ago, but his name is Epaphroditus. Let me read it for you. Philippians 2, 25 to 30. This is Paul, and he's describing this one servant. I've thought it necessary to send you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, and your messenger and minister to my need. For he has been longing for you all, all and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Verse 27. Indeed, he was ill, near to death, but God had mercy on him. And not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I am, the more e- I am the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again, and that I may be less anxious. 
So receive him in the Lord with all joy and honor such men. Verse 30, pay attention. For he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. Epaphroditus was a man who had denied himself for the sake of Christ. And so my challenge to our sync team, to our, our deacons, our leaders, to say, look, we all need to be Epaphroditus's, risking our lives for the sake of Christ. Understand this, the greatest challenge we have as Christians is our own self. But Jesus calls us to kill our own self. The call is that we must say no to ourselves and yes to God. It's like Jesus' example in the garden. As he, as he was praying to God, what does he say? When he finally said, you know what, I've come to grips with the gospel. I know what I must do. What does he say? Not my will, but yours be done. Second, in order to be a disciple, we must take up our cross. We must take up our cross. Now, I want us to understand that the cross is not a religious symbol, a symbol as we've come to think about it today. The cross, in fact, was an offensive symbol to first century Jews. It was a symbol of agony, shame, and death. I mean, death by crucifixion was, was slow and, and a painful one. And so the, the, the Jews knew all about the cross. Some say over 30,000 Jews were crucified by the Romans around that time. It was, a very, it was very public for some to see crucified individuals around the land and on the roads. In fact, it was the official way to die back then. Therefore, Jesus' words about the cross and connecting it to following him was unheard of at this time. So in order for anyone to be a true disciple, a follower of Christ, they must be willing to die in Luke's gospel, it adds, he must take up his cross daily. It means every day we're faced with our self, and every day we are killing it for something far more better. Allow me to reference two passages to help us to get an idea of what we're looking at here. John 19, 17. I'll just read it for you. So they took Jesus, and he went out, listen, bearing his own cross, to the place called the place of Skoll, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. Here is Jesus. He's on his way to Calvary, bearing his own cross on his back. Then, in connection to that, we are called to follow his lead. Hebrews 13, verse 13. Let me start with verse 12. Hebrews 13, chapter 13. So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Verse 13, therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach that he endured. I mean, do we get the images here? To bear his cross is to follow in his footsteps and to bear his reproach, to identify with his life, death, and resurrection, and not ourselves, not our own self-esteem. One writer put it this way, so to take up the cross evokes the picture of of a condemned man who is forced to carry on his back the crossbeam upon which he is to be nailed at his crucifixion. It is a shocking image of someone going to die. It is a radical life of dying to your own selfishness. So what does this mean on our level, church? It means that every moment we are fighting to kill our own selfish desires to serve each other to serve ultimately Jesus Christ, just like Epaphroditus. It means that in the face of opposition, shame, and suffering, and even death, it's never gonna stop us from following him. From the outside, people might say, this is so foolish. But if you recall Paul's words, what does he say in 1 Corinthians 4? We are fools for Christ's sake. Next, we conclude with what I call the call to gospel identity, the call to gospel identity. Here we find four motivations or reasons 
as to why we should deny ourselves and pick up our cross. And so it follows the command. If, if I had a pen and paper, I would show you. It follows the command in verse 34, right? That's the command, verse 34. And then we have four motivations, and it all starts with the word for. And so basically what I did here is I'm just going to follow with summary statements. Verse 35, for whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. Reason number one, deny yourselves and pick up your cross because if you try and save your life in this world, you will lose it forever. But if you lose your life in this world for the sake of Christ and his gospel, you will live The corresponding verse is found in John. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. And then in the following verses, verse 36, we're we're faced with two questions. And really, these questions are statements from Jesus. Verse 36, for what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? Reason number two, deny yourselves and pick up your cross, because if you gain the whole world, you will lose your own soul. Look at verse 37. For what can a man give in return for his own soul? Reason number three. Deny yourselves and pick up your cross because you can never give anything in return for eternal life with Jesus Christ. The more we grow in knowledge of Christ and as Christians, the answer to these questions is nothing. Nothing. For what does a prophet man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? Nothing. For what can a man give in return for his his soul? Nothing. Let me give you an example from the Bible to what desiring the world looks like. If you're following the McShane reading plan, you probably read through the story of Lot and how God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. It's a story we're all too familiar with. If you recall, Lot was told that God was going to destroy the city, which was worldly in all its ways, Sodom and Gomorrah. So angels, what it, so angels came into the city and they practically had to drag Lot and his family out. And what were the instructions? Do you remember? Don't look back. Then what happens? Lot's wife looks back, and she became a pillar of salt. The story is a testimony to a person who looks back, desiring the things of this world deep down in their hearts. Now, here's the reason why I'm telling you this. There's a connection here. The Lord Jesus Christ tells of a biography, a really short biography of Lot's wife, and it's found in Luke, Luke chapter 17. And in its regards to being kingdom-minded, and this is, this is Lot's wife's biography according to Jesus Christ. Let me read it for you. It's found in Luke chapter 17, verse 32. Remember Lot's wife. Then he says, whoever seeks to preserve his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life will keep it. Remember Lot's wife who looked back at the world, who so enraptured with the world and became a pillar of salt. Lastly, verse 38, for whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Reason number four, deny yourselves and pick up your cross because when final judgment comes, Jesus will be ashamed of those who never radically followed him. Friends, I know these are hard words. It it took me a while to grasp the entirety of this text. In fact, I can't wait to talk to Rod and say, I can't believe you made me do this. (laughs) But but you feel the words, the the weight of Jesus' words, and my inner self is always saying no. It's always saying no. But I'm reminded of Jesus' journey to Jerusalem. I think we all are. And so what we're doing is we're going to prepare for chapter 9 and following as Jesus makes this journey to Jerusalem. 
And so many things. See, here's what Jesus does. He always tells us, and then he shows us. And so he's going to show us from chapter 9 and following. He's going to show us that he was betrayed by Judas, that he was denied by Peter, that he was abandoned by the majority of his disciples, that the crowds hated him. They wanted to kill him, that the elders, chief priests, and scribes all mocked him. But it is the king on the cross who showed us what true self-denial looks like. He carried his own cross as he walked to Jerusalem. He took all the shame, all the hate. He took all the darkness. He said no to the earthly throne. And he said yes to God's ultimate plan by bowing his head and saying, it is finished. It is finished. I'm going to just close here. If you ever wondered if the disciples ended up denying themselves and taking up their cross daily? Well, of course they did. I mean, Acts tells us they were just on this mission to proclaim Christ, to follow him to the very ends of the earth, willing to risk it all. And so I'll close here because I was reading the Fox's Book of Martyrs and I'm going to show you that the disciples followed Christ to the very end and that they denied themselves. And I'll read you snippets of some disciples and how they lost their life. And it'll be on the display here. Philip was born in Bethsaida in Galilee and was the first called by the name of disciple. He labored diligently in Upper Asia. He was scourged, thrown into prison, and afterwards crucified. Luke, the evangelist, the author of the gospel, which goes under his name. He traveled with Paul through various countries and is supposed to have been hanged on an olive tree by the idolatrous priests of Greece. Matthew, whose occupation was that of a toll gatherer, was born at Nazareth. He wrote his gospel in Hebrew. The scene of his labors was Parthia in Ethiopia, in which, later, which latter country he suffered martyrdom, being slain with a halberd in the city of of Nadaba. And of course, we're reading Mark's gospel. So let me add Mark. He was born of Jewish parents to the tribe of Levi. He's supposed to have been converted to Christianity by Peter, and under whose inspection he wrote his gospel in the Greek language. Mark was dragged to pieces by the people of Alexandria, ending his life under their merciless hands. And then Peter the one who rebuked Christ, denied Christ, but in the end followed him. He was born in Bethsaida in Galilee. He was by occupation a fisherman. Peter is supposed to have suffered martyrdom at Rome during the reign of the Emperor Nero, being crucified with his head downward at his own request. Church, may we all be disciples of Christ no matter what the cost. Count the cost. I plead with you. He is worth it, not because I say so, but because the Bible says so. Let us pray. Dear God, speaking in my flesh, I know this, I did not do this text justice, but Lord, you are perfect. Your word is perfect. And so as we read and reread this passage, as we live the Christian life, remind us time and time again that there is a cost to following you. That here in America, it may look a little bit different, but there are brothers and sisters who don't have the freedom that we do, but are being persecuted, just like your disciples. And so, Lord, you are calling us to deny our own self and how that looks like here in our own context, in our own culture, whether we need to deny ourselves and serve our family, deny ourselves and serve our church, deny ourselves and serve our community. Lord, let us not be ashamed of the gospel, but to proclaim you and to follow you to the ends of the earth. No stories will be written about our church. No stories will be written about us. And that's okay. Okay. 
because we look forward to that hope where we will see you in heaven. We thank you, Lord, for dying on the cross for our sins, for rising in on the third day, for sending into heaven so that we will one day worship you forever and ever. And that is our hope. Lord, we worship you. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.